Would you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you for making us one with Christ, those of us who believe, for rescuing us when we were helpless, when we were weak, when we were ungodly. God, now as we turn our attention to your word, remind us afresh of the superiority and supremacy of what Christ did on our behalf. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. In a moment, we're going to take communion. Those of us who believe, who are clinging to Christ uh, as our Messiah and Savior and Lord. And so we typically have everyone uh, take communion when their hearts are prepared. Today, we're going to do it a little bit differently and, and just ask you to hold on to the bread and juice when those things come. Uh, And right now, I want to just spend a few moments preparing us to uh, take communion. And so we're going to do, to do that, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, there's some men on on the sides who are going to pass out Bibles. Just raise your hand if you'd like a Bible from these men. They'd be glad to put a copy in your hand. And if you got one of those copies that they passed out, our passage is on page 173, page 173 in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. And in this passage, what we'll encounter is two unshakable pillars supporting our confidence in Christ's eternal redemption. Two unshakable pillars supporting our confidence in Christ's unshakable or in Christ's eternal redemption. The first pillar that we'll see is the efficacy of the Levitical system, and second, we'll see the superiority of Christ's sacrifice. Let's read our passage Hebrews 9, starting in verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption." For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The first unshakable pillar supporting our confidence in Christ's eternal redemption is the efficacy of the Levitical system. We see this in verse 13. Look again at verse 13. It says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. Because the author of this text wants to exalt Christ as highly as he possibly can, in order to do that, he turns our attention again in this book to the Old Testament, particularly to the sacrificial system that God established through Moses in the Old Testament. And in order to lift Christ as high as he possibly can, he points to the efficacy or the efficiency, the effectiveness of that system He says, if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, dot, 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 sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. That if is not a, if it actually worked, but it's an assumption that this most certainly did work to accomplish those ends, although they were temporal, it did accomplish that. It accomplished external sanctification. It set apart the one who in faith brought these these things. It cleansed or purified the one on whose behalf the animal died. And why? Because 
God was the one in his infinite wisdom who determined that this is how his people should approach him. The means that he ordained at that particular time in redemptive history was through animal sacrifice. And because God determined that this is the appropriate, the best way at that point in time for his people to enter into a relationship, peaceful, uh, reconciled relationship with him, then those who in faith offered the things according to God's instruction received the benefits of that cleansing, that purification. And so this was the means by which God determined that his people could have that temporary reconciliation with him. And it was effective. Over and over, you see, as the law is being established, in Leviticus especially, that the priest would make atonement, and then the one bringing the animal sacrifice would be forgiven. If, you're, uh, if your reading plan died somewhere around Leviticus... <laughs> Go back and look for this. The priest would make atonement and forgiveness would most definitely follow. And so this was effective. The, the people under that system could trust God when he said that this was an effective means of atonement. And it is precisely because the Old Testament system was effective in that temporary earthly way that God intended that our confidence now on this side of the cross and Christ's eternal redemption can rest on another unshakable pillar. And that's what we see secondly in this passage, the second pillar on which our confidence in Christ's eternal redemption ought to rest is the superiority of Christ's sacrifice, the superiority of Christ's sacrifice over what even worked in the Old Testament. Look at verse 14. How much more, then, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How much more? This is a way of arguing from the lesser to the greater. If this is true in the lesser sense, what happened in the Old Testament, then certainly all the more must this be true about Christ. If animals sanctified and cleansed men under the old covenant, then how much more will Christ cleanse our consciences now? Everything about this passage screams, Jesus' sacrifice is better. Jesus' sacrifice is better. Jesus' sacrifice took place in a better location, even, than the Old Testament sacrifices. Look at, back now at verse 11. The location of Jesus' sacrifice was better, because verse 11 says, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect, perfecter <laughs> tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not to, that is to say, not of this creation, where Christ made atonement wasn't in a place that is on earth. He made atonement in the actual place after which what was found here, the tent, the tabernacle, the temple, was just a pattern. When Moses was given that pattern by God on Sinai, build it this way, use these materials, make sure that they're these colors, make the designs in the craft this way, that was a pattern of what was actually existing already in heaven. The Levitical priests never ascended to heaven to make atonement. And so the place in which Christ made his atonement was better. It didn't have to be packed up and moved around wherever the Israelites traveled. It couldn't be uh, rummaged through and ransacked like we see happen with the temple that was eventually burned down uh, before the exile and then again in 70 AD. The place where Christ made atonement was not temporary, but eternal in the heavens. And so not only was the place, the location where Jesus made his sacrifice better, but also Jesus' offering was better. The offering itself, 
when Christ offered, what Christ offered was superior to what the Levitical priests offered here on earth. Look again at verse 12. He says, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place. Christ didn't offer animal blood to atone for sins when he made atonement. His own blood, his own blood was the offering. The value of Christ's person was what made his blood valuable. It was the life of the person, the value of the person that made the life valuable. And so the infinite value of Christ's blood came from the inestimable value of Christ's person. Again, notice the superiority not only of the location or the offering that Christ made, but also Christ's sacrifice is superior in its sufficiency, in its sufficiency. Verse 12 says that he did this once for all, once for all. That means once in one, one time only. There was no need for him to offer another sacrifice after he did it the first time because the first one was sufficient. The first one was sufficient. In the giving of the law, on that famous day, every single year, Yom Kippur, when the the day of atonement, when the priest would make atonement for the entire nation, in the instructions themselves is the assumption that when it happened, it was insufficient. Why? Because God told them before the first time it was ever done, that this would have to be done yearly. It would have to be done every single year. In that is embedded the assumption that as soon as the sacrifice is offered on the Day of Atonement, there will be a need for another atonement the very next year of the same kind. It's insufficient. Not only is the insufficiency embedded in the timing of the instructions, how often it had to occur, but also in the fact that there were certain sins for which there was no atonement. There was no atonement for every single sin. That's why we see in uh, in Psalm 51, David actually says in his repentance for his adultery, he says, you don't delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. There was no atonement for the adulterer. And so David even recognized, as every other Old Testament worshiper who drew near in faith, that this is an insufficient means of eternal redemption. And so Christ's sacrifice that we see here is superior not only in its location, not only in the offering itself, but also in its sufficiency. He only needed to shed blood one time, never to die again. Furthermore, notice in verse 14, the means by which Christ offered himself. The means by which Christ offered himself. Verse 14 again reads, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself. Through the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself. The means by which Jesus endured the wrath of God on the cross was none other than the Holy Spirit of God. If you've ever wondered, while while God the Father is pouring out all of the wrath against every sin of everyone who ever believed, past, present, and future, while God the Father is pouring out his wrath against those sins on God the Son, what was God the Spirit doing? In that few-hour period, where was God the Spirit? This verse tells us. He was sustaining God the Son to endure the eternal wrath of God. The eternal Father pouring out his eternal wrath on his eternal Son, the Son had to be upheld, sustained, empowered by the eternal Spirit. That's what God the Spirit was doing while Jesus was on the cross. And so the means by which this atonement was offered was even better than what we see in the Old Testament. And finally, we see the the superiority of Christ's sacrifice in the objective of this sacrifice. The objective of this sacrifice. Uh, 
He offered himself through the eternal spirit, verse 14 says, without blemish to God, to do what? Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That is something that no former sacrifice could accomplish. To cleanse not just the flesh, because that's what this is in contrast to. It wasn't just the flesh that was sanctified and purified and cleansed. What was it? It was the very conscience of the worshipers. The conscience of the worshipers. Where despite whatever sins had been formally committed, despite whatever sins would be committed in the future, because of the superiority, because of what Christ accomplished in his death, the very conscience of those who drew near to Christ in faith would no longer have remaining sin to account for. That is amazing news for us. If you have any idea, if you have come to know at all, to any degree, the kind of sinner that you are, the kind of sinner that I am, then this is good news to you. There is no hope in and of ourselves of being found pure and holy and blameless before God. We don't stand a chance. God's standard is absolute perfection, and because God doesn't change, he cannot, will not, and desires not to change his standard for people who would stand in his presence. We must be blameless. Children, kids in the room, you must be blameless before God. Being a good kid is not enough. We must be blameless before God, and the only means of accomplishing that is to draw near to Christ in faith, to believe that he alone accomplished this on our behalf. And this is what we remember when we take communion. We remember Christ and him crucified, what he did, who he is, and what he accomplished on our behalf. In a second, the, the ushers are going to come forward. They're going to have a little cracker. They're going to pass out trays with crackers and, a, and, and juice on it. Those are symbols of what has just been described here in this passage. That Christ's body was torn for those who believe him. That his blood, his life, was poured out to the fullest for those who believe him. And so if that is your one hope, if that is your only hope, none of your good deeds will suffice. And if you recognize that, if you acknowledge that, if you love that truth, then we welcome you to take communion with us. If you don't believe this message, if you have still been holding out hope that Maybe you're a good person, and yeah, Christ's death is good, but it'll make up for, for whatever I can't bring to the table. Then this isn't for you. This isn't for you. We would encourage you to just take time during the next few moments as we sing while the elements are being passed. Consider your utter hopelessness before God and the insufficiency even of your own good works. If the very system that God himself established, this was not dreamt up by man in the Old Testament, and if that, even that, God's own system that he established that originated in his infinite wisdom, if even that was insufficient, then certainly no works that we bring to the table on our own could possibly help in our plight before God. And so consider that in the next few moments. Don't take communion. And if you have any questions about that, talk to me. Talk to people, anybody you see up on stage. We would love to make known, make clearer, help you think through the implications of, of what we are celebrating and proclaiming right now. And so as we sing to men, you can come forward now, men. Uh, we're going to sing, and so while the trays are being passed, just hold those cups carefully, and don't take, I'll come back up and I'll lead us in taking together. <laughs>